The Borgdorf family in Berlin, one year and nine months after the coronavirus outbreak. They're happy, they're healthy, but the pandemic has taken its toll on the family. Work and school, both have been taking place at home. It has been a difficult time. I often get sad. I don't feel like doing anything. It feels like a depression. And this feeling won't disappear just because schools are now reopening. Many kids have psychological issues. They're afraid of new lockdowns. What can parents do to help their children during this difficult time? Welcome to your COVID-19 special. I'm Chris Colbert in Berlin. Almost 60% of parents noticed the pandemic has negatively affected the mental health of their children. That's according to a study recently conducted in Canada. Kids showed anxiety, outbursts, drastic changes in mood, difficulty sleeping, as well as persistent sadness. In addition, many children experienced st stress associated with fear that family members, friends, or they themselves would become infected by the novel coronavirus. Not being able to go to school, to learn in the classroom and to meet friends, these have been issues impacting children around the world particularly hard in this pandemic. They've been concerns about a lost generation, not only in India, where after being shut for more than a year, schools in some states are finally reopening. But in Delhi, many are choosing to stay away over fears of a third wave of coronavirus cases. Schools have reopened in Delhi, but the students aren't back here. For 17 months now, these classrooms have been empty. 28x. Instead of schools, screens have to do. Ashbir Singh has gone up two grades since he was in a classroom last. He misses his friends and was disappointed when he heard he still doesn't get to go back to see them. He had big plans. The first thing is playing in the playground with friends, enjoying the time, and I would request the school that uh, on the first day we meet, there, is no, uh, there should be no classes, and we can do whatever we want. The government has said schools can resume with the consent of parents. And Parveen Kaur, Ashpi's mother, is not yet comfortable giving it. She does worry about her son falling behind without the structured teaching a classroom offers. Welcome back, my children. And as a kindergarten teacher herself, she is deeply familiar with the shortfalls of online teaching. Thank you. Good job. But the still fresh memory of the terrifying surge in cases earlier this year haunts her. During the second wave, hospitals were overrun. We ran out of oxygen and medicines. We weren't getting what we urgently needed. This is why we're worried. If there is an outbreak, we won't be able to get proper treatment. Though this hesitation has left many schools shuttered, they are ready to welcome the kids back. Isolation wards, thermal screenings, as well as staggered lunch breaks are just some of the coronavirus precautions the government has mandated. Yet both administrators and parents are not sure that it is safe to return. We put these all over the school. As a principal, Sadna Bhalla expected to feel euphoric when schools were allowed to reopen. But the announcement has left her concerned. She understands the worries of parents about a potential third wave of cases especially as some experts anticipate it could hit children hard. There are also doubts about the level of pediatric care available in the capital. The fear is real because um, there's no one telling us for sure that hospitals are equipped, don't worry, vaccinations are available, send your children with confidence. They're saying if the parents allow, so the onus is, nobody's taking responsibility. It is this lack of clarity that worries core. As a parent and a teacher, the safety of the children is paramount. Get them in love. Ha, ha, ha. For now, she is determined to keep cooking up ways to engage and excite a class of 40 toddlers through a computer screen. But she knows that the highlight of her day, welcoming her students with a long hug, is still far away. 
For more, let's bring in Jamie Lackman. He is a senior research scientist with the Department of Social Policy and Intervention at the University of Oxford in the UK. Welcome to DW. Now, children spend a lot of time away from classrooms and their friends and in front of screens, along with all the other constraints the pandemic is causing. Will all of this leave lasting scars on children's psyche? Well, that's an excellent question, Chris. Uh, children and families have faced unprecedented challenges during this COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen higher rates of violence, less social interaction, delayed education, lockdowns, and these really can have a lasting impact on their lives and their future development. But we also have to remember that children have an inherent resiliency and capacity rec to recover from adverse experiences, especially if they're given the right sort of support. And this includes helping parents provide that nurturing and loving care to them. Hmm. I want to talk about the support in, in just a moment. First, you mentioned challenges. Now, an estimated 1.5 million children worldwide have experienced the death of a parent, a custodial grandparent, or other relative who cared for them as a result of COVID-19. How do we tell kids best what this virus is and what it can do? I think it's really important to try and communicate to children at their level, to really understand the developmental stages that the children are at, and to really give children the opportunity and space to communicate their concerns and fears. And there's a lot of really helpful information on the websites for the UNICEF and the World Health Organization that can provide parents with guides on how to talk to their children about COVID-19, how to talk about bereavement, and how to cope with some of those difficulties. And we've been developing those uh, resources very closely with both UNICEF and World Health Organization. Hmm. What symptoms are there by which parents can recognize, my child is not well, they need help? Well, I think the first thing we have to think about is um, that it's important that parents establish strong and positive relationships with their children so that they can notice if their child is needing help or extra support. Uh, sometimes children might start acting more withdrawn or less communicative, and at other times they might be acting out or behaving in difficult ways, interfering or, or acting in ways that they haven't usually been acting in, like interfering with their siblings or um, other um, difficult behaviors. And I think in for parents, they can really be open to the children and make a space for them to communicate to them so that the children can uh, express and feel like the parents are someone to go to when they do need help um, and when they're not well. Now, you were involved in the development of the COVID-19 parenting tips. Now, you already mentioned communicating on the child of the uh, on the level of the kid is, is one of these one of these tips. What other pieces of advice can you give us? So I'd be really happy to share some of these. Uh, we developed these tips in collaboration with the UN and donors like Lego and Oak Foundation and so many volunteers who helped us translate them into over 100 languages so that they were received by almost 200 million people in 186 countries with 33 governments putting them as part of their national COVID-19 plans. And some of the most important tips were um, simple ones that were around that relationship building and also reducing stress for parents in their daily lives. And so one of them was the uh, tip to spend five minutes of one-on-one -on -one time with your child every day, letting your child choose the activity and following your child's lead during that activity. For teens, it could even be having a conversation and letting them choose the topic. Or for kids, it could be hmm. any sort of game or activity that they like doing. But for parents, and this is really essential, is that they need that opportunity to reduce their stress so that they're less reactive and more responsive to their children. And we help them think about how you can take a pause, even three or four or five deep breaths can make a difference in how you respond to your children in a more loving and nurturing way. And Jamie, uh, briefly, if you would, what's next on the horizon as COVID-19 continues to impact families' lives? Well, COVID-19 hasn't ended. And it's still really having an immense impact on people's lives all around the world. And I think that it's really important that remember that parents could always use more support, especially those living in difficult situations like crowded and violent communities, struggling with poverty or other pressures. 
And so we're, we're working really closely with our partners to rapidly develop and test scalable solutions that can combine both in-person and digital approaches to support parenting. And so the next five years, I really think that this will take a combined effort from universities, governments, NGOs, the private sector, so that we can really make sure that millions of families are receiving evidence-based, accessible, and useful support that is meaningful to their lives. Jamie Lackman of Oxford University, thank you for talking to us. Thank you. Now, amidst all these projects, we urgently need to finish. Children demanding our attention now. And of course, trying to stay healthy, we all could use a little break. So before we let you go, here's some advice from the COVID-19 Parenting Initiative. Maybe it'll help make your daily life in the pandemic a bit less stressful. Enjoy and see you back here tomorrow. You can count to ten, play a game or do something.